Aging is used uh, uh, as a tool for us and against us many times. I remember uh, at a, I think it was a Senate hearing, but it might have been a Supreme Court um, pr uh, trial, but uh, the question was raised, well, how do you define pornography? Because pornography is, can be uh, construed as art or as teaching or as pornography, and the uh, senator said, well, he said, um, I can't define it, but I know it when I see it. Aging is the same way. For example, uh, a beautiful woman might come in and sit down next to you or something and visit, and um, you notice that maybe she has a few wrinkles and uh, a brown spot on her hands or something. But she's very attractive, and you say, uh, it comes around to, well, how old are you? And she says, 25. Well, you know right then that she's not telling the truth, because you can recognize age, you just, it's hard to define. And that, that goes along with the idea that the chronologic time of your life, the number of years you've lived, does not necessarily correspond to the biologic age. Hopefully, we're all younger than we are chronologically, but uh, we'll, we'll address that. Now, there are four uh, four theories, let's say, and they're not just theories, these are proven, but there are four factors, certainly probably dozens, but ma major factors that seem to cause aging and I'm going to go through those one at a time. And also, while I'm doing that, I'll try to present to you uh, ways that you can take or avenues that you can pursue to reduce that type of aging. So at the end, then, you'll have a pretty good idea about what causes us to get biologically older, uh, might enable us to get chronologically older if we're lucky, and uh, what to do about these things. First of all, uh, some of the statistics on aging. Uh, I asked a question in my uh, paper that you have a copy of. Is life expectancy lengthening? Well, we all know it is. They've been telling us that for years, you know, and they say, well, when they first started, let's say, Social Security, people retired at 65 and they were expected to die at 67. And I know in the last two years, we've thought, well, now if you've reached the age of 75, your life expectancy is another 10 years. So life expectancy is really the, the time of your age right now and what time on a statistical basis you could be expected to die. There is a difference between life expectancy and lifespan. Human lifespan out here at the end of the spectrum really hasn't changed much uh, almost as long as we've been keeping records. Now, that, I'm going to ignore the biblical records. You've all heard about as old as Methuselah. And he was supposed to be 600 and some years old. I don't remember his exact age. We currently are increasing our life expectancy about three months a year. So by that, if your life expectancy is 75, let's say, uh, you're going to get three months more, uh, you live one more year and you can expect to three, live three months longer. So, you know, you think, well, gee, if that keeps working, maybe I can get to 122. Not going to work, folks. Sorry. <laughs> We're getting a lot more people that reach, a, not a whole lot, but quite a few more people that reach 100 due to this increased life expectancy. But when you start looking at the number of people that are 110, 115, 120, the uh, levels today are actually less in some instances than they were 10 or 20 years ago. But so our lifespan is not increasing, but we're getting more older people. That definitely upsets the actuarial tables for things like Medicare and Social Security. It makes it very difficult to uh, balance the budget, so to speak. Okay, uh, the oldest lady uh, living is 116 right now. She's a retired school teacher and she's U.S. She lives in the state of Georgia. Her name is Bessie Cooper. The uh, oldest men are usually two that have lived the, the longest times 
are generally a few years younger than the oldest women, but the men are close. The record um, for women is 122 years, uh, 164 days, and that was held by a lady in France who died in 1997. There are fewer women today, over 115, there are two, than there were in 2006 when there were four, and in 1997 when there were three. So you can see what I'm driving at. Well, maybe if we can identify so-called markers. A marker is, in biologic terms, is just like a roadside out on the turnpike or something. You measure yourself by it. If we could identify markers that would point to the causes of aging and something we can do about it, then that gives us a way to take action and live to be older. That's a good idea in most cases. One of the um, very significant uh, factors, which I'll address in just a minute, is the so-called glycation phenomenon. Another of the four factors we'll talk about is called telomere shortening. Another is cell membrane disruptions. And the final one is uh, adult stem cells. So we're looking at those four different areas of biologic sciences. The uh, glycation phenomenon has a, is a very, very, has a very, very um, descriptive acronym. It's AGE, A-G-E. That's kind of what we're talking about. But it stands, it, it doesn't stand for age, it stands for advanced glycation end products. I know that's a bit of a mouthful, but it's written in there. Uh, what we're talking about is uh, the combination of the glucose mo molecule with a protein, and that's a glycation product. Those are used in various uh, energy production cycles, hormone production, and so forth, and at the end, you end up with trash, basically. You've got a product that you can't get rid of. You can't recombine it, and you can't eliminate it. It just stays there. It's a little bit like ashes in your fireplace, which you can get rid of, obviously, uh, but they're, they're useless. Uh, clinkers, is anybody they're in the uh, steel processing uh, foundry business, they end up, when the coke is burned and so forth, you end up with clinkers, and there's no way to, to use them again, so they're disposed of. But unfortunately, in human, uh, human uh, furnace, we can't get rid of them. Um, an example of a glycation end product is beta amyloid. This gets a lot of press these days when we talk about Alzheimer's disease. Now, I can remember uh, when I was a resident in pathology uh, doing a lot of autopsies and examining brains on people who died, and frequently in older people, we found amyloid. It, it looks uh, under the microscope and under the appropriate stain, you can see it very easily. It just looks like a, a homogeneous piece of pink material, like you'd key punch something out of one of these uh, questionnaire things on your table. Um, so, and we didn't really have what we called Alzheimer's disease 30 or 40 years ago. It's, it's a current big deal now. Well, what's the difference? Because we've had beta amyloid forever. So there's something more than amyloid, I think, going on with Alzheimer's. Uh, just this is kind of an aside. Some of you were here last week when I was talking about fluoridation. And fluoridation, uh, fluorides increase the absorption of aluminum by a factor of about 500. And people with Alzheimer's often are identified uh, on the, under the microscope by finding what are called neurofibrillary tangles, but they're filled with aluminum. So that's the reason some people think there is. Uh, uh, aluminum is a factor in Alzheimer's. Other heavy metals also, other metals also. <laughs> aluminum isn't very heavy. Um, and we still, we still just really don't know what causes Alzheimer's. Uh, some of the things I'm going to address, however, in terms of uh, getting rid of uh, age, the 
end products of this glycation and the other uh, factors in aging, some of the things that I'm going to suggest will help prevent Alzheimer's, no question about it. People who have these good health habits and do these things are very late or, or don't develop Alzheimer's at all. So I don't know how to, uh, all I know is I want to do some of those good things. Okay, um, now on these uh, glycation end products, I would say this, there's uh, no way to really prevent the formation of those products, but one thing you can really do that will really help is control your carbohydrate intake and your weight. Now that's, uh, that's kind of a hard thing to, <laughs> to do sometimes. Um, all you have to do really is uh, sit and wait, let's say, uh, at the airport or someplace and just start looking at people and you know there are an awful lot of people these days that are uh, not just overweight, I mean they are huge. That's why some of the airlines you know have started requiring people of a certain size to buy two airline seats because they take up two seats. So this, it isn't easy. Uh, the particular diet that I'm fond of and um, I think most doctors who are really up on diets these days are, and that's be either the so-called paleolithic diet or the primal. Grains are important just because um, in the processing in the matter amylase, which breaks down those grains into sugar. And if you do a um, glucose tolerance test with equivalent amounts of carbohydrate, sugar, uh, one equivalent and uh, bread, another equivalent, they're equal in carbohydrate content, you can actually increase the, the sugar uh, level following consumption by 50% more with the wheat than you can with the um, glucose or uh, sugar. Sugar itself is composed of two molecules. Uh, one is glucose and the other is fructose. Fructose is the worst of the two. Glucose is not quite as bad, but the thing about fructose is, um, particularly when it's consumed as high fructose corn syrups or any form of corn syrup, is that the, all of the uh, fructose is normally uh, circuited to the areas where there's fat on your body and is deposited as fat. So when you see a fat lady in the airport drinking on a 32 ounce Coke that's sweetened with, high, with large amounts of high fructose corn syrup, you start knowing why she's fat. She doesn't know it, but, and probably a lot of doctors haven't found this out yet, but that is what happens. Uh, in so doing also, there are two other problems encountered with fructose, and that is fructose does not uh, increase the release of a hormone called leptin, which is a satiety hormone. It, it tells you it's time to quit eating. And at the same time, fructose allows uh, ghrelin, which is a hunger hormone, to increase. So it doesn't increase the guy that's bad, and it decreases the guy that's good. So fructose is a, a double whammy, really. I understand, Ron, <laughs> this is Dr. Hunting Hockey back here. Uh, we had one of our other doctors here. I don't see her right now. Anyway, oh, Jennifer, there she is. <laughs> you guys can uh, weigh in on this, but I understand from the nurses, Ron, that almost every patient you see now, you're starting to get them on a low wheat diet, restricted grains. Uh, this is really contrary to all the popular thing, you know, the, the diet pyramid of it is whole grains. And you hear about all, oh, you know, if you want lower cholesterol and lose weight and lower blood pressure, you've got to have uh, five to ten servings of whole grains a day. Boy, it's just the opposite. You shouldn't have them. The, t <laughs> the total, uh, total intake of carbohydrates is uh, probably safe at the... Uh, a level below, let's say, 130 grams per day. Certainly, uh, I used to have patients that I'd put on a 60 gram carbohydrate diet, and invariably when they came back and I'd check their 
uh, cholesterol and their triglycerides, they'd be reduced and they just couldn't believe it. They said, well, yeah, but if I don't eat these, I'm eating all this fat. And I said, don't worry. And it's true. If you eat wholesome fats, <coughs> meaning avoid trans fats in particular, um, and plenty of protein and reduce your carbohydrate intake, you will be healthier. And that's genetically the way we are programmed. That goes back, that's why they call it the Paleolithic diet. It goes way back to uh, before 10,000 years ago. Okay, any questions about uh, advanced glycation end products? A uh, second thing that um, I'd like to address is uh, the telomeres. Let's see, wait a second, I've been forgetting this. Another, uh, another way we can approach the age-related uh, glucose products is through intermittent fasting. That's kind of a, fasting is a naughty word in some circles and, and the uh, best thing in the world in other circles. I remember a friend of mine once was an uh, Air Force pilot and he got too heavy and they were gonna take him off of flying status, which he didn't want. So he started fasting just one day a week and his weight went down from like 240 to 190 or something in a relatively short order, and he was able to stay on flying status, but it really does work. Uh, intermittent fasting refers to fasting for a day every third day, or uh, intermittently can also be fasting for about 16 hours a day every day. And once you do that, you start uh, getting better control of your uh, insulin and your uh, avoidance of the of the hunger. The problem when you have uh, you high blood glucose and then you get an insulin, insulin response and you get hungry pretty soon because your blood sugar is going too low and it has to raise it again. I, there are just thousands of diets out there and so-called gurus, you know, and they say, well, just eat a little bit of carbohydrate, but you got to have a snack between meals. And, you know, they've got people eating carbohydrates six times a day. That's because they feel bad. If they don't do that, they feel hungry after that first meal, so they want to eat before. So they s satiate this uh, earning for carbohydrates, but at the same time, they're uh, causing to be stored. You don't get skinny that way. Uh, these are some of the benefits of intermittent fasting. A low plasma insulin and decreased blood sugar. I just mentioned that. Uh, the symptoms and signs of so-called metabolic syndrome or type 2 diabetes are all related to this process. And in type 2 diabetes, you have high blood pressure, uh, high fat, and so forth. So only, everything good comes from intermittent fasting. A second way to approach um, age is through high-intensity interval training. That's uh, a code word now for exercise, but it's increasingly uh, used because it causes these effects. Um, all of these uh, good things are, are mirrors. The opposite side of, the, say, uh, low body fat is high body fat, and that's associated with aging, and so on through these uh, six the characteristics. High intensity interval training is uh, an extension of what was used to just be called interval training and that meant that you just exercised for 10 minutes or whatever the interval was where it was set and then you rested, exercise rest. The uh, key to this is high intensity. You need to exert enough effort so that you're out of breath and you can't continue the exercise. And the way that I have done it, and I think the easiest way, frankly, is just get on an elliptical trainer or you could do it uh, jogging, running, walking. Um, but the way to do it is to uh, exert yourself all out for 30 seconds and then you rest for 120. The idea that in every two minute cycle um, for 90, for every two-minute cycle, 
you have gone through a cycle, an interval of your training. And you do five to eight of those intervals, which is going to take uh, 10, to 15, 10 to 16 minutes. That's your exercise. There was a, a book written a number of years ago now called Slow Burn, and, and they, uh, they described a form of interval training that is different. But the thing that stuck in my, uh, my brain about this is that if you do that interval training once a week, you will markedly benefit. You will improve your physical conditioning markedly over time. You just have to keep doing it. Twice a week is probably uh, very doable for uh, senior citizens. Uh, I would not recommend doing it more than twice a week. Now, let's go on to telomeres. I always get confused about that word because I don't know whether it's telomeres or telomeres, but uh, <laughs> Jennifer, do you know what it is? <laughs> I've heard Ron stumble on it too. That's what I'm saying, it's telomeres, okay. Uh, the word uh, telomeres comes from uh, two Greek words, telos meaning um, end, and mirrors meaning uh, part, end part, or in, in this case we're using as end cap. But at the end of uh, all of our chromosomes, uh, there are end caps, telomeres. And these telomeres uh, can be readily demonstrated under the, the microscope. Uh, some of the uh, laboratories have attached stains that fix themselves on those telomeres. And then when you look at it, it looks like there's a bright little cap on the end of every chromosome. And uh, the significance of these in aging has recently come to light. The telomeres can be thought of as uh, these long wispy ends and uh, they shorten. Every, every time something bad happens or the cell divides, uh, those telomeres shorten slightly. So it's almost uh, like seeing rings in a, in a tree that you cut through. Every time you see a ring, you know it's another year on a tree. Well, every time you see those telomeres shortening, you know that something has happened in that cell. Generally, cell division is when those things shorten. Now, how many cell divisions are there in a the lifespan? 60 to 100. Depends a little bit on the cell, but that's going to happen 60 to 100 times throughout your life, and that's, uh, that's kind of your biologic clock. Uh, there was a Dr. Hayflick some years back who figured out the number of cell divisions in a lifespan and, and the uh, limitation uh, that those place on our lives, and that became known as a Hayflick uh, limit. And it still stands. The question is, becomes, can we do something to delay or even uh, replace those shortened telomeres so that we get a few more cell divisions at the end of our life? Uh, as it turned out, yeah, there are some things we can do about that. Um, uh, instead of having this program senescence, I call this a time to live and a time to die. Uh, we can do a good diet, helps. Particularly, I would, I would hark back to controlling your blood glucose and insulin levels. Um, exercise helps, as we've already described. And um, there, are, um, there is a product available which seems to uh, help uh, lengthen or repair these telomeres also. This uh, product uh, was found by a Geron Corporation and uh, it started out when they discovered that um, there, are, there are enzymes at the end of the telomeres and naturally they're going to be called telomerase but <laughs> these enzymes have to do with repair and there were one type of cells in our body we're Which? all born, every cell in our body has 46 pairs of chromosomes. And when, we, when those cells divide, they split, and there's 46 pairs again, except as we age, the telomeres shorten on 44 of those pairs. The sex chromosomes maintain their length. 
product that was discovered by the Geron Corporation. It's a product of the astragalus plant, which grows in some province in China. And they've uh, isolated the active factor in that. Uh, they have 127, I believe it is. I'm sorry, 270 filed patents on that. Uh, everybody wants a piece of the action, I'm sure. And they've been uh, trying to use it since 19, um, 2005, let's say. Uh, it's been effective. It seems to be prolonging people's lives. Telomeres are staying longer and no side effects uh, described to date. If you care to go for that, it's going to cost you about $1,000 a month, as nearly as I can figure. Now, $1,000 sounds like quite a bit to spend on telomeres once a month. You can't see them or feel them until you live longer, I guess. So what else can we do? Well, here's something that uh, Dr. Huntinghockey mentioned uh, a week ago tomorrow, and that is glutathione. Glutathione is a... a, a, a an antioxidant that's found in every cell in our body, really, is very critical. And glutathione production diminishes with age. Uh, so it's nice to have a way to elevate your levels of glutathione. Now then, they have uh, so-called nanoparticles. Very, it means very, very small. And you can, they have nanoparticles of glutathione, which can be absorbed through the intestinal tract and through uh, sprays, I think, in the nose and mouth. So we can, uh, now we can retrieve or boost our levels of glutathione. Another, and the, the glutathione is composed of three amino acids, glycine, uh, glutamate, and cysteine. The uh, significance of that is that those three amino acids can also be found in certain uh, combinations of proteins, pretty good in eggs, for example, but the really good one is whey, product from milk. So a uh, pure whey, um, high-quality whey is a good way to uh, link, if you take it on a regular basis, to uh, lengthen your telomeres. I've listed in the... Uh, your uh, handout, uh, several effects of raising the uh, levels of glutathione, including <laughs> increased cognitive function, raising the levels of growth hormone and guys, levels of testosterone. I haven't seen this written, but I suppose it works for women too. No reason why it shouldn't. So I'll uh, parenthetically insert estrogens in there. Improves body composition, that means your fat to muscle ratio improves and uh, prevents depression. So that is what happens with telomeres. Now the next topic that we want to uh, address are the cell membranes. A question, I will recognize you. <laughs> Well, I think I haven't I haven't read the labels on those, but some of the whey products are are actually uh, kind of recombinations of factors derived from milk. They they hydrolyze it and break these things down. That's probably not what you want. If that says hydrolyzed whey, I'd say see if you can find one that isn't that way. That's not to totally condemn it, but. Uh, yeah, the bodybuilders, obviously they're interested in building muscle, and so they know they're taking it. Ron? Undenatured way. Well, they denature it by hydrolyzing it. So. <laughs> ah, good. That'll be the right stuff. Jennifer? Western and Eastern medicine for raising white blood cells and HIV patients. But well, you mentioned it being anti or lengthening the telomeres. But you can actually get the root and not the thing they're trying to extract out of it and use it as well. But where do you get it? So she's saying, yeah. You can get it. I mean, you have it in supplement form, tea form. 
that you can get a hold of the root itself. It's How do you take it? Um, you can you can cook with it, make stews with it. Uh, cook with it, make with what? You can make soups with it. Astragalus root. You make soups with it. Soups. You okay. You boil water and you make soups with it. That's the best way to use it. Okay. And we learned how to do that in school. So astragalus, you can buy the roots. Uh huh. Right, and it helps raise white, white blood cells. Okay, helps raise white blood cells, <laughs> and maybe it makes people. Maybe it helps lengthen telomeres. We don't know for certain. They did go, I know, through a, a lot of scientific uh, investigations, and the product is called TA65 that this company sells. And as I said, uh, trying to put two and two together, I think it amounts to about a thousand dollars a month. I bet the roots are a lot cheaper, but maybe less concentrated too. Good soup. Okay. Yes. It is available as a supplement. Yeah, it's something that we produce in our bodies constantly. Mm -hmm. But it's available as a supplement. Yes, it is available as a supplement. We have that, don't we, Ron? What's the recommended dose, Ron? Fifty milligrams a day. Well, the old glutathione would just be digested, and you wouldn't get any absorption. Right. I'm going to repeat that if you don't mind. <laughs> Dr. Heimhockey said that we have the preparation. It's in the form of a liquid. You have to start out with a small dose, like a quarter of a teaspoon a day, and then build up to a teaspoon a day. Because initially, if you take too much of it, you'll get a detoxification uh, syndrome uh, because it's involved in detox, I guess. So start, easy, start low and work it up. Uh, how much does that cost? Fifty bucks a month. Well, that sure beats a thousand. Yeah. <laughs> Any more questions? One more. Did I understand that there is a spray, a nasal spray? I think there is. Yeah. It's the uh, Not the glutathione. Not the glutathione. Okay. Jennifer, any more comments? No. Nope? Okay, I'll try on the next one then. <laughs> okay. Uh, next, I'd like uh, to talk about cell membranes. Um, cell membranes for ages, it seems like, probably 75 years, have been recognized as being made out of fat. I know it sounds crazy because... I always want to th think of a membrane as something kind of solid and fat, but it is fat. In fact, it's a, it's a double layer of fat, and um, the name for this double layer is amphipathic, which just really refers to the fact that the outer surface uh, is, pardon me? Anyway, the outer surface likes water. And the inner surface hates it. What'd you say? Okay. <laughs> any rate, so they're, they're, they have two different uh, fats in there, and they form this layer. And that layer just isn't over the cells in your body. That layer is also uh, covering the nucleus, which is inside of the cell, the Golgi apparatus, the mitochondria, anything inside there is protected from its neighbor, so to speak, by a membrane. And this membrane is a bi bilipid membrane, two layers of uh, different types of fat. One of the interesting uh, things about this membrane is it is in a constant state of flux. Um, and some of the molecules within that membrane move about very rapidly. And this has been documented with all kinds of uh, chemical and um, electron microscope studies. So it's called a, uh, I forget, the, like a flux membrane. Now then, uh, some people describe the cell membrane as the, the place in the body where everything that's important for life happens. And um, I think in, 
and looking at it closely, they're probably closer to right. That makes this cell membrane business very important. Cell membranes are porous, and they can transport substances in and out of the cell. Some of you may have heard of sodium pumps or calcium channel blockers and so forth. These are medications that take advantage of these properties on the cell. Um, the uh, cell membrane also is subject to damage, and that's where we start getting into lesser longevity and aging. The uh, cell membrane, uh, because so many things are happening in it, it's subject to changes in the electronic uh, electron potentials. Uh, nerve impulses, for example, are traveled tr along uh, cells on the surface with calcium on one side of the membrane and um, with positive ions on one side of the membrane and negative ions on the other. So uh, this enables cells to talk to each other. The cells, uh, cell membranes have receptors, which are also a form of communication between cells. And there are even studies now, this is hard for me to believe, but it's true, <laughs> that, uh, that indicate and it's a form of intelligence between cells. And they can band together like cancer cells, for example, talk to each other and they say, okay, now you go out and find out a good place for us to go next. And the cell will, the, <laughs> The messenger cell will come back and they talk to each other and say, okay, now we're going to metastasize now, let's say, to the liver. So that's where it goes. And so on and on and on like that. So when something goes wrong with these cell membranes, we've got problems. And as the problems mount, we get older and older and older. What to do about it? Well, um, incidentally, a lot of this work was done by uh, two fellows, Singer and Nicholson, and I happen to be a pretty good friend of Nicholson, and I've uh, presented studies with him a time or two, and I've gotten to know him, been in his home, used to, used to live in Houston. So I can vouch for the fact that he's a good guy, and he knows his business. Uh, so what can we do? Well, they came up with a product called uh, li lipid replacement therapy, and, let's see if I have this. Oh, we'll come back to that one. That's good. Did I get out of order? Okay, sorry. Yeah, I do. This is it right here. How to restore the mitochondrial membrane. Remember? <laughs> That's lipid replacement therapy. What they've done is they've taken these fats and uh, not only identified them, but they have formed a preparation which has them in the same concentration and ratios as they're found on our cells and inside of our cells. And fortunately, the membranes of the outer surface of the cell and of the uh, components within the cell, the nucleus and mitochondria, they're all about this identical. So they combined this list of uh, substances. They're forms of fat, basically, fat and protein. And um, they have a li lipid replacement therapy. A lot of the doctors who are using this put every patient that comes in their office on this preparation. And they get some uh, rather miraculous effects. Some people have felt increased energy, for example, in a matter of a few days. Uh, some people have, have felt it, and then they think, well, I'm just imagining it, and so maybe three months down the line they stop taking it, same old symptoms come back. So it's a very critical thing, and most people who have uh, low energy syndromes will be assisted by taking this fat therapy, fat replacement. Okay, finally, is the stem cells. Uh, I don't know much about uh, this, but I do know that this is correct. Um, part of it's correct. Uh, Dr. Mendel, who's a very, very uh, noteworthy nutritionist, has uh, been instrumental in, in finding a uh, group of uh, nutrients which address uh, the decrease in stem cells that we experience in our bodies as we age. You can actually measure stem cells or 
uh, in, in our own labs. I guess Dr. Yeah, Dr. Mikarova is back here. You'll see, if with aging, you can see the uh, number of endothelial, endo, <laughs> endothelial progenitor cells diminish. That's a, kind of a second generation stem cell. Same thing with the adult stem cells. They're going down as we age. How to get them back up. What they, and the reason that's important is that stem cells can go around. This is their normal function. They go around throughout the body, and let's say they find, well, there's something wrong with the liver here. All these liver cells are sick. So increased numbers will come there. They can change, uh, go through a, a process of metamorphosis, and they can change to the functional liver cell and replace the damaged or, di or da dead or dying cells. And that happens throughout the body. Heart, you name the organ, and... Uh, the adult stem cells can replace those cells. And that's why this, this theory of stem cells is so interesting and, and is such a stimulus to research. They're tr looking for ways to fix people's brains that uh, have been injured, or spinal cords, for example. Maybe we can replace the cells that are damaged by a beta amyloid or whatever is causing, al causing Alzheimer's. So that's a very key thing. Um, Dr. Mendel has come up with uh, a list of nutrients. <laughs> he calls them the 10 super nutrients. And this product is called Stemtrol. Uh, you can buy it, it's about 60 bucks a month, as I recall. And um, what this does is stimulates, according to Mendel, the release of stem cells from the bone marrow where they're normally made. He does not claim that it increases the number of stem cells uh, or the production of stem cells in the bone marrow. He just says it stimulates the release. And they have documented higher levels of adult stem cells when they, uh, patients uh, take super nutrients. So, as kind of a conclusion, um, you can see that there are a lot of things that we can do to detect aging in the laboratory, measure stem cells, glucose, insulin, uh, take a look at the cell membranes and so forth. Uh, there are a lot that can be done to help those things which we've listed, and none of it is, would be considered easy. Uh, so I've got a quote here from Ethel, Ethel Merman, and she said, that growing old is not for sissies. And then I wrote, considering the foregoing nutrient and lifestyle recommendations, for the postponement of my expiration date, I would say that she was dead right. Couldn't resist the pun. <laughs> uh, from my perspective, lifestyle changes such as diet and exercise make a lot of sense. Uh, I, I don't, I'm not fond of the term supplements when we're trying to use a nutrient as like a medicine, but at any rate, there are a number of supplements that will help. Um, resveratrol, which I've passed over. I'll go back to that here. Yeah. Uh, this turns on <laughs> your anti-aging genes. You've seen advertisements for this on TV and so forth. And uh, this has been, a, uh, a resveratrol is the chemical in red wines. And some people think that's why the French people tend to live a little bit longer than non-French. But I don't know. But at any rate, just for your information, you can see that red wines have a pretty a good amount of resveratrol in them. I haven't either. I thought about going to... <laughs> the question was, what is muscadine? Um, anybody know? Well, that's, that's very likely right. And it, is, it is high in resveratrol. I guess somebody, we need somebody that runs a liquor store here or something. Jennifer? I don't run a liquor store. At <laughs> <laughs> any rate, that's good. Nine or ten of them? I did yeah, not. It's in the southeast. What she said is... Uh, most of the super nutrients, is that the one you're talking about, are in our product called Stemkine? Yes, it's up in Dome 1. How much does that cost? It's expensive too, I remember that. 40 or $50. It's called Stemkine, K-I-N-E. 
It was actually, uh, I don't know who put it together, uh, Dr. Mikarova. Okay, let me repeat. Uh, Dr. Mikarova back here is our director of research, and uh, she can turn out a complete research project in about the time it takes me to write a four pages of a presentation. But at uh, any rate, uh, a product was developed here uh, called Stemkine, and was not um, a Neil Reardon part of that. Dr. One of Dr. Reardon's sons was part of that uh, development and owns a company that produces it, incidentally. At any rate, um, they put together a product which is similar to this, and it's definitely effective in the uh, increasing the production of stem cells. Thank you. I'd kind of forgotten about that. Any more comments or questions? Pardon me? The stem yeah, it will boost your stem cells. Yeah, your adult stem cells. There's, a, I kind of think of it as generations, but there's the uh, basic stem cell in the bone marrow, which can differentiate on it down into uh, an organ cell, let's say. But it goes through adult stem cells. Uh, then an endothelial progenitor cell would be a second or third generation in which it's differentiated into the type of cell that lines blood vessels. That's an endothelial cell. But uh, it, you can't get a, correct me on this if I'm wrong, uh, Dr. Mikarova, but <laughs> you cannot get an endothelial progenitor cell because, without having an adult stem cell. So it's just, it's the first generation is a primordial stem cell, then the adult stem cell, and then the differentiated cell towards the organ, endothelial in this case. All right. Um, from my own standpoint, I, I do follow a lot of these diet and exercise things that I have listed. Uh, I've thought about trying um, this stem troll or stem kind. Uh, I haven't done it yet. Uh, glutathione, I think, would be the next logical place to go uh, past the basic things. And. Um, I would say this, uh, we've all heard this expression, I think, um, and that is, uh, if I'd known I was going to live so long, I would have taken better care of myself. Well, so <laughs> obviously, if you do want to live longer, you should take better care of yourself, and now is the time to start, so I encourage you to do that. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Oh, sure. The question is, can I re repeat the times for the high-intensity exercise? This can vary, but the, but the key is you've got to reach exhaustion. If you were lifting uh, 10 pounds, let's say, and did it 100 times and couldn't lift it 101, you've done it. But why not lift 100 pounds four to eight times, reach exhaustion, and you've cut your, the time of exercise way down. Now, the times that I mentioned was 30 minutes of all-out effort on an elliptical trainer. That'd be like a treadmill, but the elliptical trainer uses arms and legs both for 30 seconds. You gotta, you I mean, you gotta really go so that you are really tired in 30 seconds. That's half a minute. Then for the next minute and a half, the next 90 seconds, you rest. You can do the, the elliptical trainer very slowly, for example. Just stay on it and keep moving, but you're recovering. And then you repeat that cycle. That's a two-minute cycle five to eight times. Tiffany's here nodding her head. Did I do that right? Okay, clear enough. Any more questions? Another one. It is that. Pardon me. Yeah, explain why the uh, coconut oil is still a good fat, uh, even though it's a saturated fat. First of all, it's it's coming into use as a cooking oil. 
Have you ever tried it? Yeah. It has, I think, a slightly sweet taste to it. But as long as it's not a trans fat, we've found out that you've got to have these fats. They're, they're critical in uh, forming the central nervous system, forming cholesterol and so forth. Um, so instead of avoiding saturated fats, it's, it's okay to have them as long as they're not trans fats, which are really fats that have been hydrogenated so that they will be liquid at room temperature. And, uh, or is it the reverse way? At any rate, uh, now it makes them liquid, I think. So just avoid the hydrogenated fats, which are trans fats. The trans fats actually uh, change the, the cell membrane on our, on our cells, and it becomes kind of wrinkled and crinkly instead of smooth enough and flexible. And this is bad. So go with your saturated fats. Don't worry about it, as long as they're not trans fats. And it'll tell you on the food label. If it says hydrogenated, partially hydrogenated, don't do it. If it says contains no trans fats, that's good. He's nodding his head, but he looks a little puzzled. Yeah, I have seen that. Um, I have uh, known patients or, or of patients on whom that has been tried and it made no difference. So it must be something individual about that particular approach. What he, he's saying is that there has been a treatment uh, proposed for Alzheimer's which consists of giving the patients um, coconut oil fats. In fact, they're, I think they're taking like a tablespoon three times a day or something, right? It seems like a lot. It doesn't taste that bad, though. Yeah. Studies done on alcohol consumption versus Alzheimer's. Dr. Reardon said years ago that most of the studies that he did when he was in school on, uh, were on um, people that were brought into KU Med Center deceased and they did autopsies on them. And alcoholism was the biggest problem that they saw. And he said he felt like uh, alcoholism was grain allergen and all alcohol was made from grains. Now, have they done any studies of alcoholism versus Alzheimer's? Well, probably, but I can't quote them. Her question was, have they done any studies on the correlation, I guess, between alcoholism and Alzheimer's? I don't know. I really don't. Um, thinking about it, I do know that alcoholism is an abuse of something that uh, a lot of people believe that an ounce or two of alcohol a day it will be good for you. It helps correct abnormalities in the lipids, uh, high-density lipoprotein versus low-density. Uh, Dr. Kalmar, did you have a comment on that? No. no. You weren't really alcohol. bidding on it. You were just scratching your head or something? Oh, okay. <laughs> You know, when you're at an auction, you got to be alert here. Uh, I don't know. Um, certainly, any, alcohol can is very abusive it, uh, when taken in excess. Oh, there are alcohols available from petroleum, for example. There are other sources of alcohol than grains, but most of the ones that come in a bottle at the liquor store are from grains. Yeah. Multifactorial, and it's hard to do research and on any one thing causing something. So, you know, whether it's alcohol and Alzheimer's or mercury and autism, I think it's just a very hard thing to even do research on these disorders that are multifactorial. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Doc, Dr. Kamar pointed out that a lot of times uh, the causes of disease are multifactorial or conditions. And if you just isolate and try to look at, say, just alcohol, it doesn't work. But if you looked at alcohol and B12 deficiency, maybe, and some of the other things that might go along with alcoholism, you'd have a correlation. 
you have had a stroke? Question is, can you have repair if you've had a stroke? The answer is yes. Um, you certainly, uh, you've got to have stem cells to repair neurons. And we've always thought, you know, hold on one sec. Do you want to pass this out right now? You want me to draw and then, because some people may want to leave. Yeah, I'll answer your question in just one minute. If there's somebody anxious to leave. Here it is. Get ready. Paul Penner. There he is. Really? Are you related to Kathy Penner? Or, or not Kathy. Do uh, you have a daughter? Okay. Wrong, wrong Penner. But I know there are a lot of you out there towards, <laughs> uh, towards Hutch, I guess, and in that area, right? Yeah. Okay. Where were we? Repair of strokes. Okay. Yeah. I, I, of course, the reason they're trying stem cell therapy and brain injuries like spinal cord and so forth is for that very reason. They're trying to get adult stem cells in there that will differentiate into neurons. We also know now that neurons aren't a lifetime thing. They actually can uh, multiply by division and so forth through life. So those two things. Now, thirdly, and we've got the Dr. Ryan Muller behind you there. <laughs> Who's the guy who's running the barometric chamber right now? Um, in, in a stroke injury, uh, the number of damaged cells is forms, uh, it's like a, the tail of a comet. Are you familiar with this? It's called the penumbra. And within the penumbra, the farther you get away from the center of the problem, where there's not enough blood, let's say, or too much, you begin finding just dead neurons initially, but as you expand out from that, you find ne living neurons that are non-functional. They're considered to be in an idling state. And by exposing those uh, idling neurons to oxygen at increased pressures, you can revive them and they'll all of a sudden start, not all of a sudden, but over a period of treatments, uh, usually 40 is the recommended first, first treat, uh, dose, doses. 40 exposures, uh, those idling neurons will begin functioning normally and, you know, people will retain maybe not 100% of their function and some of it will never be repaired, but uh, they say a person who couldn't talk will begin to talk, a person who couldn't walk will begin to walk and so forth. So there's, yeah, you can do a lot for strokes.